Good evening, folks. I'm Scott Monroe, the managing editor of the Kennebec Journal, Morning Sentinel, and CentralMaine.com. Thanks to everyone who is joining us tonight for the latest live stream of Maine Voices Live Waterville. We're thrilled to have nearly 200 people who registered for tonight's chat. Of course, we hope to eventually move these live discussions back to in-person venues provided by Colby College. But for now, in these days of social distancing and curve flattening, we'll continue to bring you these voices through Zoom. A huge thanks to Colby College, which has continued to support this programming in these chaotic and uncertain times. And we wish the college well as it finalizes its plans for the coming school year. And now I'd like to turn it over to Mike Weiskup, the Director of Athletics at Colby College, for a few words. Colby College is proud to be presenting sponsor of this event, which is helping to keep our community connected during these days of social distancing. We look forward to hearing from world champion parrot climber and Maine native Maureen Mo Beck about her extraordinary success as a competitive athlete and her ongoing efforts to support the parrot climbing community. Colby has a long history of and takes enormous pride in achieving excellence, which is why we're very pleased to be supporting this important discussion. And Mo, when we open our new facility, which will be the best in class for the whole central Maine community, we hope you'll consider coming by to do some training on our bouldering and climbing wall. Thank you again, and we hope you enjoy the conversation. All right, and now on to our guests. Our featured speaker tonight is Maureen Beck, who grew up in Ellsworth, Maine. Mo wrote for the first time at age 12, developing her potential as a one-handed climber. Now based in the Colorado Front Range, Mo was named one of National Geographic's 2019 Adventurers of the Year. She spends her nights training and her weekends climbing all over the American Southwest. She works closely with the adaptive climbing community through Paradox Sports and the Paraclimbing section of USA Climbing, and she helps manage the Front Range Adaptive Climbing Team. As a competitive climber, Mo has won five national titles, a gold medal at the 2014 Paraclimbing World Championships in Spain, and she defended that title with a gold medal at the 2016 World Championships in Paris. In 2017, Mo became the chair of the USAC Paraclimbing Committee. Aside from climbing, Mo loves gardening, her chickens, dogs, sleeping in cars, and fine scotch whiskey. Speaking with her tonight is Mike Siemens, who's been a staff photojournalist at the Morning Sentinel for the last decade. Mike is also an award-winning international photojournalist whose work has been published by the Weather Channel, Foreign Policy, The Atlantic, USA Today, and other outlets. He was named the 2018 and 2019 New England Region Photographer of the Year by the National Press Photographers Association, and he is also a two-time grant recipient from the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting. Thanks to those grants, in 2015, he reported on the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone, and earlier this year, I had the pleasure of helping edit edit his ambitious enterprise project about the impact of renewable energy expansion on remote regions in Canada and Maine. I know Mike's done some gnarly climbs in his own right, several of which resulted in cool photo projects in our newspapers. So now please welcome Maureen Beck and Mike Siemens. Thank you. Thanks so much, Scott. Appreciate that. Hey, Maureen, it's great to see you. Good to see you too, Mike. Um, so, you know, since we're in this new age of digital uh, interactions, especially from a sport where being connected is very much a part of the everyday life, let's transition into how you're uh, dealing with that stress, you know, the, the immediate stress of that shift of gear since uh, February. Yeah, so it, it happens on many different levels. So there's the sort of like, you know, the obvious, which is, you know, schedule. So I'm a professional rock climber. You know, I, one of my jobs is to travel all over the country to different climbing gyms and universities that have climbing gyms to train them how to work with people with disabilities to get everybody climbing. Um, I can't do that anymore. And then there's just the fun style of travel, like fun climbing. Um, or even climbing for work if I'm doing photo shoots or something for one of the brands that I work with. Um, that was off the table. And I, as we approach, you know, this quarantine and this virus getting more real and real and real, um, I started seeing like the whole spring just, just vanish, both from workload, from fun trips, um, all the way to what was supposed to be my biggest trip in two years, um, just kind of vanishing. Um, 
So there's definitely that identity crisis of if I'm not traveling around the world and the gyms are closed, so I can't train for competitions, like who am I? How can I be who I am if I'm not climbing? Um, so that, that, was a, that was for sure um, a struggle. And I haven't slowed down in about three or four years. I've been going at this go, 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 travel, 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 um, definitely burning the candle at all eight ends because um, that's how many fires I have going at any given point. And so at first, you know, when we got the stay at home order um, notice, I was just like, kind of devastated is too strong of a word, but I just didn't know what to do with myself. Um, but I also don't do well with being bored. I kind of, it's not an option for me. Um, so all of a sudden I decided, well, you know what? time to garden, you know what, time to get a new puppy. Um, and I kind of had this realization of, uh, with my chickens actually. So I had chickens for the longest time. Uh, I love them, I grew up with them. And when I bought my house here in Colorado, one of the first things I did was get chickens. But then when I started traveling and my climbing career really picked up, I rehomed them. Um, one, because my husband hated them anyway, and I just wasn't around enough to take care of them. Um, and so they had a happy new home. And then during quarantine, not only was I bored, but you know, we all thought the world was ending and all of a sudden eggs were disappeared and were like $6 a dozen. So I thought, let's just, let's get chickens. I have time now. Um, and then over the last, over the last few months, I realized that I always should make time for the chickens in my life, you know, whether they're, li they're literal birds or figuratively, um, because I realized I was just going so fast that. I was missing things. So I've decided that I have these chickens now, I'm getting two eggs a day. Um, and I decided that if I ever feel like I don't have time for my chickens again, it's time to pull back and slow down. Um, Cause life was just going by way too fast. It was a blast, like don't get me wrong. Um, but I think that's my takeaway from this forced slowdown is just like, you know, we all need room to breathe. Um, so that's been kind of good. And my garden is in great shape. Um, I wasn't the kind of athlete, um, like, you know, Instagram and Facebook and all of our social media has been filled with, you know, professional climbers training, you know, hanging from their fingertips in their basement and, you know, training for climbing. So as soon as they could get out to climb, they could like get back at it at a high level. And it just, that just never really, never really struck me the idea of training that way. Well, it, I mean, training, it seems like an evolution for you. Um, yes. Because <laughs> I, I know from the documentary Stumped, you had, I mean, you are a strong climber off the couch. You are one of those lucky individuals <laughs> who go out and send no matter what. But you have an affinity for cupcakes. You like marshmallow sandwiches yeah. with chocolate chip cookies. I mean, who doesn't like that? But that seemed to have been the hurdle of you ex you know, making that leap to the next level, mm -hmm. which requires that um, focus and that full commitment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Can you talk about that shift that you went through, that metamorphosis you went through? Of yes. It's all about finding the right motivation. Um, climbing climbing is kind of hard to describe, I guess, if you're not a climber. Um, so I like to use skiing as kind of the metaphor. Um, it's really easy to get comfortable skiing. Like you can ski black diamonds, but you can prefer to do like the greens and the blues and the mellows. Um, and you can do those without trying hard, without practicing. Um, but if you really want to push yourself, it takes a time and dedication. And for most of my career, um, I was like the green climber. You know, I was very happy on not hard things. I was happy just to be outside. Um, but then when I moved to Colorado, I moved here in 2012 and around 2014 is when paraclimbing competitions became a thing. I had done competitions in college, um, but I was always the only paraclimber. So I was just like, I'm really just going for the kegger after. Like it's college, I'm gonna place last. I have one hand, I'll go for the social part. But you know, it wasn't really motivating for me. When paraclimbing competitions started, all of a sudden I had this metric and this community that I actually could compare myself to. Um, and I found that really motivating. And I don't know if I was always competitive, but I've learned in the last few years that I am competitive. <laughs> um, and the beautiful thing about climbing is for the most part, even in competitions, you're competing against yourself. Because right. uh, so much of climbing is mental. Um, and really using competitions as the switch to be like, wow, I wonder if I can win. 
And if I do win, how can I keep winning? And then I started climbing more outside. I took that philosophy outside where it's like, I can climb easy all day, but I wonder how hard I can climb. I wonder how hard I can push this. So finding that motivation, that switch, that's what really helped me um, kind of make that decision. And I think you have to. I think you can't just casually maybe make a choice like that. I think you have to say, no, like, this is a goal of mine. Um, and I'm going to design my life around it. Like, I'm going to, you know, get a job that is flexible that lets me do this, even if it pays me less. I'm going to sacrifice seeing my family um, to go pursue this thing, just to know exactly how hard I can push it. Um, and I don't think I found the limit yet. I, I thought that that climb in Stumped um, was going to be the high note, and then I could just like back off and go back to being a green climber or blue climber. But instead, it just let the fire even more, where I just want more and better and higher and maybe more suffering now. <laughs> Well, it's, it's funny you say that because you were talking earlier about uh, making that transition into alpine climbing, kind of uh, leaving the sport climbing world behind, using that as more of a training ground of mm -hmm. getting strong and understanding the dynamic of climbing and taking it into a big mountain feel. What spawned that um, genesis? What, what made you want to go after that next level? Yeah, so in, in the world of climbing, to transition from being in your 20s to climbing hard as nails routes that are close to home, um, it's, it's a pretty common career move for a lot of climbers. As you get older, you get creakier, things hurt more. <laughs> um, so instead of short and hard, you go for long and easy, but maybe more remote, maybe with terrible weather, maybe there's more, it's more expedition style. Um, and so that's just kind of a natural progression. Like I feel like as a climber, as your body breaks down, you're kind of left with this option of not climbing or doing a different type of climbing. Um, Almost like you want to get rid of the serious pain of the really hard comfort and do the more long-term suffering of like a three-day ridge. Yeah, exactly. Um, and basically, I got more excited about ideas, like a friend would propose something, and the more awful it sounded, the more likely I'd be to say yes. Like, why not? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, something that I wonder, as, as I don't really consider myself much of a climber anymore, um, but one of the challenges I found from times, time away from climbing was the mental uh, shape. The process of tying in, looking at the route, uh, mm -hmm. part of that mental preparation. It's not something that you can train for away from climbing. It's something that you have to actively be doing. Mm -hmm. Do you notice a lag when you get back and tie in of getting your head back into shape or is it immediately there? Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, quarantine is a perfect example where, so between, you know, I live, 20 minutes away from thousands of climbing routes outside. And I have probably 20 commercial gyms within two hours of my house here outside of Denver. Um, so quarantine was the first time in maybe five years that I haven't tied in in some form for more than two weeks, maybe. Like two weeks before this was the longest break I had taken, um, which is crazy. <laughs> um, and for sure, like not that long ago, you know, um, early June, probably, we finally, you know, went back outside for the first time. Uh, the gyms were still closed. And, you know, even though I've been climbing for 20 years, I've been tying that same knot for 20 years, my partner and I still looked at each other like, this is right, right? <laughs> um, and then just the simplest climbs that we had done, you know, dozens of times before we went to like our classic, our usual crag. Um, it felt so exposed and shaky and it, yeah, it felt scarier because, you know, I think we spend so much time climbing to like push down that primate brain that says, you should not be up on this rock wall. Like this is a bad idea. Gravity will win. And we push that away and we rationalize it. We're just like, no, I have a rope. It's safe. It's fine. Um, over quarantine and over any break that that monkey brain comes back. Um, and it, it <laughs> Would you also say that there's like, uh, is there an added stress to going out into the mountains during this time? What if there were an accident? What if you did require um, mountain rescue? What if your climbing partner tested positive? I mean, it, you know, yeah. climbing, it's very communal. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's everybody's in contact. Everybody knows each other. Everybody's sharing everything. And the idea that you're separated by 200 feet of rope at all times is that's a very small portion mm -hmm. of, of the day, right? So how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, as far as COVID climbing, there's definitely been an interesting cultural shift in the climbing community. Um, in early March, it was 
Like you, it was so frowned upon to go climbing. If you posted a photo on Instagram of you rock climbing from that day, people would be like, why are you risking it? Like stay home, don't risk the rescue. But since then, like, especially now that we're in the end of June, um, the community's kind of gone quiet on that. Like no one's doing anything crazy, but now it's just more community acceptance that, okay, we're all out climbing now. Like the governor of Colorado says it's okay to go out climbing. Um, for me personally, I'm still not risking. I mean, I'm, not, I'm a very risk averse climber anyway. Um, I'm way more likely to get injured on the hike or the drive than I ever am actually climbing. Um, but it's still for sure in the back of my head um, that I don't want to be someone exposing other people potentially. But then as far as, you know, your partners go, like we certainly have like our, our COVID bubble. Um, I don't have a ton of climbing partners as it is just because you know, it takes a lot. Like gym climbing partners, sure. But when, as far as outside, I mean, you only have 10 or 12 people that I climb regularly with. And I call it my COVID bubble. That's probably only four or five people um, that I will see to go climbing with. And those are people that were kind of in my quarantine bubble anyway. Um, so we've kind of just like taken that pledge together that we're all going down together if one of us goes down, I guess. But yeah, it's been, um, you know, there have been accidents here in Colorado and it for sure was a point of contention that, you know, a climbing accident, you know, it's not as simple as the ambulance coming. Like you're typically involving a crew of, 20 to 30 you know SAR personnel um and everybody else so it's it's been interesting um but yeah I think the climbing community was especially kind of harsh and made sure like there was a lot of um self-policing that I didn't see in other communities that I'm a part of but the ski community everybody was still at backcountry skiing um more so because the ski resorts are that closed so all of a sudden you have these people that have only skied on resort buying AT gear and heading out into avalanche terrain and like peak avalanche season um fly fishing community no one stayed home because fly fishing is the original social distancing sport so <laughs> so that was kind of status normal yeah. but yeah climbing as a community it's 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 very strange because climbing is such an individual sport and oftentimes it really is just you and a partner on a peak in the middle of nowhere but then once you're back down um the climbing community itself is very large and very strong um, very so it's been interesting it's very tight yeah um, how has it affected your training schedule without access to a gym, things like that? Yeah, so right leading up to quarantine, um, we had our adaptive climbing nationals at the end of March. And so I was pretty much peak training, um, you know, gym 20 to 30 hours a week, um, outside climbing to supplement, you know, eating healthy. And um, once that fizzled away and the gyms closed, um, the first month of quarantine, I think my roommates and I got four boxes of wine, just left them on the kitchen counter, like a little, little mini bar. Uh, yeah, I ate a lot of bread, played a lot of video games. So that first month was definitely like the anti-training. Um, and it was funny because we all missed climbing and missed training, but then we looked at each other, we're like, but my fingers don't hurt. My shoulder feels healthy. It's weird. I don't, I'm not in pain <laughs> right now. So I think it was a month off our bodies all needed. Um, and then by the second month of quarantine, um, I, w I wasn't about to drop a bunch of money to build a climbing wall at my house because I like climbing in the gym. So as soon as the gym opened again, I wouldn't use it. Um, so we ended up buying a treadmill and a rower and a bunch of free weights. And so we did like fun garage workout time, nothing really climbing specific, um, mostly to work off that bread and boxed wine. Um, <laughs> But it was weird. It's definitely like, I don't, I didn't know how to fill my days because I really would spend so much time at the gym um, that all of a sudden I, I had time to do laundry. <laughs> like, so that was, going a hundred miles an hour and then hitting mud. Mm -hmm. What was that like mentally? Like, didn't you just leave your job? You're planning to, should, should I divulge to the audience that we were planning a trip to Alaska? Yes, go ahead, yeah. In, in so April. right after nationals, I think I would have gone to California for nationals, been home for two weeks, and hopped on a plane to Alaska to spend a couple weeks on the glacier um, doing some alpine and ice climbing up there. Um, and all of a sudden, probably just in time, that trip canceled because I think we were probably about a week out from booking flights. Like we were very close to heading to Alaska um, when the rug got ripped out from under us. And I have been so lucky and privileged and I'm successful enough in my climbing career that I was finally able to do it full time. Um, so I'd given my notice to my day job and said, guys, it's, it's time, I love you, but it's time for me to go. Um, I, they hired my replacement, I was wrapping up training her, and then the Alaska trip got canceled. And then all of the work I had lined up for May got canceled. Um, and I just, 
I was floating. I was lost. Not only did I lose my like physical identity because I wasn't out doing what I loved, but then I literally was at work, um, which was scary. Cause it's scary enough to take the leap. Right. And then to immediately leap into a black hole, like not even get a shot. <laughs> at trying. Um, I mean, there's, there's definitely people in the world that are way worse off than me, um, during this whole thing, but that was definitely terrifying. I did get super lucky though. in my, my job, which is a climbing wall company, um, we build, climb, we actually just built a climbing wall at Colby college for their new facility. So speaking of small, there we go. <laughs> speaking of small world, right. um, <laughs> um, fortunately, um, they were able to keep me on. So I had something to do when I woke up in the morning, but well, and I, I didn't have work, man. There's only so many, there's only so many push-up challenges you can do in a day <laughs> to stay sane. And I think, you know, sometimes the public may not understand the sacrifice made by a professional climber in the United States. This isn't Europe where you're sponsored and you, you live like a professional athlete. You know, you're, a lot of people are, hand to mouth, living nothing but what they're climbing. Yeah. And like, I, I t- always tell people, I do not get paid to climb. Like people don't pay me to just go out and rock climb. Like, um, I, you know, I, I do speaking gigs, I coach, I, I run trainings. Like it's not as simple as just waking up and going rock climbing that day. Some days it is. It's great. Like I definitely have the flexibility. But, but some days th- it's harder than anybody's toughest day at work, right? The, the climbing itself is not what pays my bills for sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a weird world and there's no how to guide to, ha- to like be a professional, cl- let alone professional athlete, but like professional climber, right? Like there's no how to guide, you just kind of fall into it. Um, it's not a career that I looked for, it just kind of fell in my lap and I thought, wow, how lucky am I to have this opportunity? So even if I wasn't looking for it, I kind of owe it to the world to just, to try it out and see what happens. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's wild. It was like finally all happening and then COVID happened. But, but in the end, I think it's kind of nice. Like, it's still uncertain. Like, even though the world's opening back up, like, who knows what's going to happen with the economy? Um, I know a couple of my sponsors, they might not even have athlete teams next year. Mm-hmm. So who knows what's going to happen next year? But if, oh, yeah. if the slowdown has taught me anything, it's that we'll, we'll figure it out somehow. And it's not like a professional climber out of work can file unemployment, right? No, no, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Life of a climber. Um, to bring it back to how we started, and I, I kind of like to develop how you just laid that out of how there's no roadmap, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you thought about a few things. But when you were 12 years old, it's not like there's a climbing team in high school or in middle school. <laughs> there's, you know, you have to be introduced to it by someone. Yeah. Someone to say, hey, you need to try this. What Absolutely. And it's, it's funny. So I first climbed when I was 12, so 20, year, 20 years ago, which is kind of insane. Um, and it's funny because now, like, there are middle school climbing teams and there are, like, climbing's the new soccer. Um, but back then, there wasn't. Um, I got super lucky and that I went to Camp Natarsui, which is a Girl Scout camp up in Millinocket at the base of Mount Katahdin. It's gorgeous. It's wild. Um, I would say it's a very authentic old school camping experience. It's the canvas tents on the raised platforms. There's moose everywhere, you know, classic mess. Yeah, just loons. <laughs> like, uh, it was beautiful. Um, but then they also had the classic camp activities. At this point, I still wore a prosthetic arm, a fake arm. And it worked well enough. So like for archery, we would duct tape my arm to the bow. And for canoeing, we would duct tape the hand to the paddle. Um, And I figured it out. That was always what I did. I just figured it out. Um, But then it came time to go climbing and it was gorgeous. They had these giant house-sized granite glacial erratics on property that they put ropes up on. So you could actually climb real rock. It wasn't just some plastic Mm. carnival there thing. It's actual rock. I just remember my counselor very nicely saying like, oh, you can sit this one out if you want. Like, I don't know. You can't duct tape your way through this. So like, it's okay if you sit this one out. And being 12 and being kind of a snot, I was just like, screw you. I'm going to climb. Um, and I did. And it probably went terribly. I don't really remember it uh, the first time, but I'm pretty sure I didn't make it to the top and probably greased all over the place. Um, it's something about climbing just stuck and I wish I knew what it was, but I don't, but that day forward, um, I went home and I went to Mr. Paperback back when they were a thing. And I think the first book I bought there was probably into thin air because back, you know, 
a lot of, I didn't realize then that rock climbing was different from climbing Everest. Right. So I, I purchased a bunch of mountaineering literature. Um, I bought Gripped Climbing Magazine because in Maine, we're too far north to get climbing or rock and ice back then. We got the Canadian uh, right. Climbing Magazine. <laughs> and I remember opening it and it's all a foreign language. Climbing has so much lingo. And I remember being 13 or 14, flipping through the pages and just having no idea what they were saying. The pictures looked cool. And I wanted to do more of it. Um, and this is also pre-internet. I couldn't Google how to rock climb with one hand or how to belay with one hand. So I was kind of just figuring it out. Um, by the time I went to high school, I kind of conned some friends into checking climbing out with me. Um, and then I also worked for Cadillac Mountain Sports. And as one of the perks, you got a free lesson with, I want to say it was the Atlantic Climbing School. Um, so I went out to Acadia with them, um, and that was just like mind blowing. I was like, "This is it. This is I want to be. I want to be the guy that took me out there. I want to be this person. I want to be. I want to be in this world." Um, we would go to Clifton a lot too. Actually, um, that was our first time sport climbing. Was up at Eagle Bluff in Clifton, mm -hmm. um, and so I just didn't quit it for some reason. And then when I went to college at University of Vermont. I didn't realize it at the time, but I, I like subconsciously selected where I was going to school based on how close to climbing was. And Vermont has some amazing climbing while still being close enough to come home to have my mom do my laundry now and then. <laughs> um, so then it was just kind of like, that was the thing. And then when I moved to Colorado, uh, we actually didn't move here for the climbing. We moved here for work. But then once I was here, I was like, well, I might as well just really take the deep dive into climbing. Um, and that was it. And, you know, I, I feel like my generation... Um, might be the last of the mentor generation, perhaps, because there weren't climbing gyms when I was learning how to climb. You know, there weren't programs. You could hire a guide, but they weren't really mentors. Where in, in college and in my early 20s, I actually had mentors, which were people um, more experienced than me who weren't afraid to take me under their wing and, and teach me how to do things and help me learn how to do things and, and not afraid to help me invent how to do things. Mm. Well, and it's interesting you, you say invent, do things, right? Because I met you through Paradox Sports, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? This really great organization, DJ Skelton, uh, uh, Malcolm Daly, really great, great humans, and, and many others. Mark Miller, mm -hmm. Folsom, and I remember meeting you at Gimson Ice 10 years ago, 11 years ago. 11 like years ago, yeah. Years, right? And um, Mark was so eloquent and so direct, right, with mm -hmm. um, how ice climbing is an adaptive sport for everyone. Yeah. Regardless, right? And that was the first time you had ice climbed, right? Um, it was near the first. So that yeah. winter in Vermont, I had decided I wanted to ice climb. Because um, when you live in Vermont, you either rock climb and ski or rock mm -hmm. climb and ice climb. It's not like here in Colorado where you can rock climb Rocky around in a t-shirt. Um, so I decided I'm not very good at skiing, so I might as well learn how to ice climb. And I was working at Eastern Mountain Sports at the time, and they gave me one of their ancient rental ice tools. And all we knew how to do is we just chopped the handle off, countersunk a screw into it so it could screw onto my prosthetic that was for like kayaking and gymnastics and stuff, kind of this like go-go gadget one. Was it that um, purple one? Yeah, it's the purple, the purple ice axe arm. And it looked really badass, right? I had an axe arm. It's cool. Yeah, um, yeah. It didn't, didn't work that well. <laughs> now I know. But it looked cool. Um, and I, so by the time I met you guys in Ure for Gems on Ice, that was probably my third time, third or fourth time ice climbing, but first season. Yeah. So, um, and it, Gems on Ice. What an eye opener. I remember a couple pictures ran in the Denver Post and the Denver Post got, there were some comments online about how can you say this about these disabled people. But you have such a sense of humor about your situation. And I remember you saying uh, you want to be known as a good climber. You don't want to be known as a good female climber. You don't want to be known as a good para climber. You want to be known as a good climber. And I can attest, <laughs> you climb harder than I do. <laughs> And, you know, I've, so you are way better than, <laughs> than I am, right? So um, what would you like to see the sports direction go as far as competition, as far as funding, as far as support? Yeah, I mean, there's always room for more inclusivity. Um, but it's funny you mentioned like the naming of Gibson Ice. So I had, so I was born without my hand been forever um and I, I do remember at one point i definitely did some kind of summer camp through the shriners program 
Um, and then I think I did some kind of other sports camp for kids with disabilities and I hated it. It was full of volunteers who were like kind of almost patronizing, just like, oh, you're so, you can do this, I believe in you, like, or like to the kid in the wheelchair, like, you're doing so great. And the kid's like, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, and I just, it just, I was just like, wow, that I'm, I might have a disability, but I'm not disabled. Like, I don't do a dis adaptive, I'm not handicapped. Like, I don't do those programs. And so I just totally blocked out that world. I was like, I'm a climber, you know, I just happen to have one hand. I, I don't really have, I'm not disabled. Um, and it wasn't until my senior year, I think it was my senior year of college, where I got an email from Malcolm Daly because I had been posting photos of my axe arm online. Um, and that ancient tool was one that he had designed in the early 90s, back when he founded Trango. So again, small world. Um, and so Malcolm had lost his leg in a mountaineering accident, so he became adaptive. In Alaska. And, yep, and in Alaska. So he put this event together that was just adaptive humans ice climbing. Um, and at first I said, he invited me. I was like, no, I'm not, I don't really do the adaptive thing. And he's like, well, it's called Gimps on Ice. The beer is free. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll try it. <laughs> do you remember that? They drink beer out of a fake leg at this point. Yeah. Um, and so Paradox Sports was the first organization that as an adult, I, I did like mm -hmm. a, a, an event with other people with disabilities. And then it just blew my mind because there's people just like me. Um, Malcolm is great at saying is, I don't care what you can't do. Tell me what you can do. So like, yeah, you're in a wheelchair, but whatever, that means your arms are wicked strong and your feet can't get cold. Um, you know, like it's just that attitude. And then what really sold me was after a day of climbing as hard as we could, um, this crew of people in wheelchairs and missing limbs and blind, they partied harder than any frat party I had ever seen. So I was just like, oh, disabled people aren't just boring whips. Like, they're, they're real humans. So that's a journey that I had to go through myself, like, to figure out what it means to be disabled. And it doesn't have to mean, like, fitting in the box. Um, and so I think bringing that kind of awareness out, um, climbing is a great sport for that because it is kind of viewed as extreme. And so I think bringing people who think they can't climb out climbing can really to kind of change their worldview. And I always tell people, you have to try climbing once. It's okay if you hate it. Um, that's fine, it's not for everybody. Um, but for me, climbing's that thing. And if trying climbing helps you find your thing, even if that thing is, you know, training goldfish to do synchronized swimming, <laughs> that's great. Like, find your thing, because that's, that's the best thing ever. Um, and Paradox knows a place that can help you train that thing. Yes, absolutely, they can, they can match you up. Um, but no, I think finding that community was was huge for me. Um, and that's when I realized I could push myself and I didn't have to kind of make excuses for myself. I don't think I ever had friends or mentors who were just like, oh, you can't do this. Like they always encouraged me to try, but I would tell myself I couldn't do that. Like I would make excuses. And all of a sudden here I am like ice climbing next to someone with no hands. And I'm just like, well, I should probably shut up and just climb then. Um, so that was a pretty wild experience for me. Um, but finding, trying to bring that community as well um, into the climbing scene. So climbing as a sport is still, still a fringe. Like we're seeing it change so much, especially since I've started. Like now it's in the Olympics, that's crazy. Um, but as far as like, you know, funding and understanding goes, it's still a very new sport. Um, so I've been working with USA Climbing. I've been competing at the Paraclimbing Nationals since it was started, uh, the first year is 2014. Um, and I've gone to every world championship since then, um, a couple of world cups, and it's been really interesting. Competition is such a great way to exchange ideas, especially for paraclimbers. Um, cause you know, as much as I love the sport, it, there's not a ton of people that are doing it, especially adaptive. So there's only so many people in the world that are disabled climbing at the high level. So the idea of going to Europe where you can meet with like 12 other women that are missing their hands at rock climb at a high level, that's mind blowing, it's crazy. And then we can also get ideas from those other countries on how they're growing their programs and how they're growing their sport, how they're getting more people with disabilities involved with rock climbing. Um, so that exchange of ideas is huge. We're trying to bring that back here to sort of legitimize um, the sport as a real competitive sport. And um, paraclimbing, um, you know, it kind of has the same shortfalls of any other para sport where you kind of get a lot of people that 
assume you're not a real athlete or just think you're just, you're just so inspiring. And they forget that you're actually a real athlete, that you've made sacrifices and that you want to be recognized, you know, for your athletic skills and your efforts. And you're not, you're not just there to inspire them. Like you want them to appreciate the work you're putting into it. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work with that too. And a lot of that's on us. Um, like one of my big jobs is to like, get our athletes to take themselves more seriously um, to kind of perform at that higher level. Cause I know they can do it. Um, there's just a lot of self doubt there and, and what high performance means. Um, so there's a lot of that attitude changing where, you know, and I think actually the U S Olympic and Paralympic teams have done a great job where the Olympic team has pretty much absorbed U S Paralympics. It's one team now. Um, and I think that model is great. And USA climbing does a great job of that. Um, to not differentiate the two to just say it's, mm -hmm. You're just climbers. Yeah, like we compete in different events, um, but it's the same sport. Um, and USA Climbing is doing a really good job at that. Would you not say like a 512A is a 512A? I mean. Well, I mean, that's its own conversation, right? Like is a hard climb for me, which like the physical same climb might not be hard for someone else. But if you took their hand off, would it actually be like, oh, this is a 514, like if you uh -huh. do it with one hand. Um, but that's what's kind of cool about climbing is the rock doesn't actually change and the rock doesn't actually care. Um, so that's what's really cool about climbing. It's no matter who climbs it, whether you're short, tall, wide, skinny, like the rock is the same. And I kind of appreciate that. Like you cannot dumb down rock climbing. Huh, that's interesting because ice, you know, the transition uh, into the big mountains that you want to make. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like everything's changing, you know? So you're yeah. the, the certainty of memorizing one route for the uncertainty of uh, a, a metamorphic. It's, it's definitely hard to compare those two sports. Right, like, yeah. So for anyone who's not familiar with rock climbing, there's several disciplines, and then you throw ice climbing kind of into it. I guess to go back to skiing, rock climbing has like giant slalom and moguls and all this stuff. And then ice climbing is like, then there's Nordic. <laughs> Like, they're still on skis, but they're different fundamentally. You know, they're, but the same, because even skiing would be an adaptive sport for anybody, because you're mm -hmm. adding, mm -hmm. you know, and Mark Miller was great at explaining that, that anybody that goes ice climbing, it's an adaptive sport, regardless. Yeah, everybody needs the tools and needs the spikes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, that's fantastic. I'm excited. Well, that's what's interesting about ice and rock climbing, um, but especially rock climbing. I've had several friends who have done wheelchair tennis or other high level, like Paralympic level adaptive sports skiing as well. Um, and they said for them, rock climbing is incredible because that's the one sport they do where they don't need special equipment. They can like leave the wheelchair on the ground, wear or not wear the prosthetic. They just use the same harness as everybody else, tie in the same as everybody else, and climb the same route as everybody else. Um, and they found that they find that very liberating compared to other sports. Um, and talk about how climbing can affect your self confidence in a way. You know what I'm saying? Where you have perceived limits, mm -hmm. um, but those perceived limits are can be shattered through the act of climbing. You know what I'm saying? Where you can look at something, and say, I don't know if I can ever do this. Yeah. Do it. Talk about that breakthrough. It's kind of fun because a lot of times that can be a pretty short curve in climbing. Um, so like every morning, so like last weekend I did a giant um, 2,000 foot face in Rocky Mountain National Park. When you start your walk, you see the peak and I'm just like, there's what? Really? We're doing that today? There's no way. Um, but then you do it. And at the end, you're back in the parking lot and you're like, holy cow, I did that. So you have that, a lot of climbing is that immediate gratification where almost every climb looks impossible from the ground. To give, to give the average listener some uh, understanding of that, what you just described. To go in to Rocky Mountain National Park, you're looking at a long approach. How long of a mm -hmm. day was it? We started hiking from our car at 4 a.m. So we left our house at 2 a.m. Okay. And you got to the base of the climb at 6.30. Okay. Got to the top of the mountain at 1.30. Got back to our packs at 3.30 and hiked back to the car at Five, you start losing track of time at, at some point. You're just like so yeah. tired. <laughs> I love how casual you throw that. I went to Rocky Mountain National Park. We did this route, you know, but it's really like a 20 hour day. Yeah, you know, it's a big day. Yeah. And it's not that fun. Like, it's like I said earlier, how I have this like weird newfound love for suffering. Like, if you were to tell me, hey, do you want to wake up at 2 a.m., drive two hours? Mm -hmm. um, you're off your poop schedule at this point. So you never know when that's going to happen. <laughs> um, 
climb a 2000 foot face in which like you can't take your climbing shoes off. So your feet are going to hurt. Um, and then hike out and does that sound fun? Like, no, it doesn't sound fun. It doesn't sound fun at all. Does it? Um, but then you do it. And even as you're climbing, not so much climbing, climbing is fun, but when you're belaying these routes, some of the pitches are like 200 feet. So you're sitting there in one position, just belaying your buddy for an hour. Um, and that's when you start to think, why am I here? I could be sport climbing. I could be doing a more fun version of climbing, or I could just be like hanging out with my dogs. <laughs> like, um, but again, that's another thing you get over. So not only do you literally climb the mountain, but then you work through all those emotions. And then at the end of the day, by the time you're like having your margarita down in town, you're just like, oh yeah, same time next week. It's climbing is so weird. <laughs> well, on that note, let's um, transition over to the questions from the uh, viewers that are, that are tuned in. Um, So yes, we have a we have a whole bunch in the queue. Um, first up, what did you think about being named one of National Geographic's 2019 Adventurers of the Year? Yeah, I thought it was a mistake. Um, first of all, because <laughs> uh, you just get an email that's just like, and actually this email um, said I was under consideration, and I was just like, wow, I didn't think that's something I could ever be considered for. But now that I'm being considered, I really want it. Um, but there was definitely some imposter syndrome going on because I'm, I'm just a rock climber. Like I'm not that extreme, you know, you, when you think National Geographic, you think like ends of the earth, you know, craziness. And like, I'm just a rock climber. Um, and so it was, it just felt really undeserved, um, but it did open up a lot of doors. And I think connected my story with a whole new audience and, and the kind of sense that happened, I've had more people reach out to me that said, you know, they're like, my daughter has one hand or my son has one leg or like, do you have any advice to like start climbing? Um, and I think maybe for some people it kind of breaks down that initial can I barrier and, you know, even fully able the people are like, well, if she can do it, I can do it. Like, yeah, you probably can. Um, but no, it did feel like a mistake, which is wild. Um, but I guess it wasn't, I don't know. It, it's just really interesting. Uh, it still doesn't feel real, um, to, to have something that honestly prestigious, um but now it's kind of good because i feel like i need to kind of retroactively earn it so it's kind of motivation to not not slow down and not give up <laughs> uh nice a uh, great follow-up question to that is what advice do you have for young athletes who aspire to reach their goals i would say like make sure to have some big goals but the smaller goals in between um kind of help keep that motivation i'm i'm actually looking at the end of my competition career and I'm having a really hard time thinking like, you know, I love rock climbing. I'll always rock climb, but competitions were nice to motivate for because that was a date on the calendar and I can sacrifice and I can train and I have that date in mind, like the end date. Like I can have my, as much beer and nachos and cheese after that as I want. Um, but without competitions, like how, how can I do that? And I think for me, it's going to be finding those smaller goals um, to stay motivated. So I think finding the motivation, but also taking a break. So not only did quarantine force me to take a break and now I'm, it was kind of a nice self check of like, okay, 12 weeks off. I still like rock climbing. Cool. We're, we're good. <laughs> um, but I think taking a break and listening to your body and listening to your mental state, I think we put so much effort into training our body that we forget to take care of our mind until we're just totally toasted and burned out and not having fun. So I don't think it matters if you're a rock climber, if you're a basketball player, if you are a professional flutist, like as long as you're having fun, I cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, could you describe how you approach climbing instruction in the adaptive climbing program? So it's not rocket science. There is some technical things where, you know, someone who's in a wheelchair might need a special rig or special setup, or special harnesses. There's certain techniques. Um, there's ways to call out a route for someone who's blind. Um, but I always start all of my instruction sessions with, remember, people with disabilities are just people. Whenever I go to a gym or talk to a facility and they're nervous about hosting adaptive climbers, um, they kind of start by saying, oh, we don't know how, we don't know how the rigging works. But then it kind of comes out that they're actually just afraid. Like, what if I say the wrong thing to someone with a disability? What if I say the word stump, but they use a different word for it? Um, and I just tell people, like, it's okay, they're people. Um, in the end, it should be no more impactful than hosting, you know, a class reunion or another special interest group um, Adaptive climbing is just another style of, of climbing. And as far as other adaptive sports go, it's really the least impactful um, to learn and to train and to have in your facility. 
um, or just go do. So my goal through training facilities to be adaptive is that anybody with any body can walk into a climbing gym and feel welcomed. Um, when I first started going to gyms, I went to a, the first, that old gym in Portland is now closed. I remember I went there in late high school and I just got looked at and stared at. Like the staff was like, I guess you can climb here. Like, can you? And it just felt so unwelcoming. And every time, even now I go to a climbing gym and people are like, whoa, she has one hand. It makes me feel like I don't belong there. Um, even now, I know I belong there, but you still feel like, you know, you're the odd one out. So the more work I can do to sort of normalize being weird or normalize being abnormal, um, doing that through adaptive climbing training, I think, I'm hoping that's the ripple effect that can really create some change in the world. That's awesome. Um, have you ever had a climbing experience that frightened you? If so, what was it? Oh, all the time. <laughs> um, you know, it's hard to, climbing is always about discomfort. Again, it's that monkey brain. You're not supposed to be doing what you're doing. Um, probably the most scared I should have been though. I was in a uh, very Northern Canada, edge of the Arctic circle. And we had just been climbing for about 30 hours straight almost. Like we had a nap in between. Um, and we were repelling and repelling was taking us much longer than we thought. All of a sudden it was like three o'clock in the morning and you make mistakes and you're that tired, especially when you're repelling. And I remember thinking like, I should be so terrified right now because I'm 1200 feet up a dark mountain. I can't see anything. My headlamp's dying. My partner doesn't even have his headlamp. Um, we can't find the anchors to get down and you're, you should be terrified. But I just remember being so tired that I didn't even care. Um, so fear, fear is a weird thing. Like fear and exposure and what your brain ends up actually doing with it. I don't think you can really predict it. Like you can try to train it out of you, but then you don't know until you're there how you'll actually react. And apparently my reaction to being terrified is just meh. Might as well get this, might as well get this over with. <laughs> so do you have a favorite climb that you did? Um, I have favorites. I, I kind of have favorite areas. Um, Las Vegas is actually one of my favorite climbing destinations because there's all styles of climbing from short and hard right next to your car to a five hour approach that's 2000 feet high and it's just it's wild and then when you're done you don't just go back to your dirty campsite and eat out of a can you can actually go into town and have fun and see shows and like vegas in january i've been i've done two christmases in vegas now um and christmas in vegas is my favorite time for climbing um kind of ever but i guess i would say in maine um my favorite climb is probably probably anything on the south face um, of the precipice. And yeah, Otter Cliffs is always a favorite. Like even though it's fairly easy climbing and I've done it forever now, like I will always go back to Otter Cliffs and climb. Uh, so we have a couple of people who would like to know what kind of conditioning you do to stay ready for climbing, physical workouts, mental exercises and the like. Um, mental exercises, like I don't meditate or anything. What I actually probably do more for my mental game is, is running. I hate running. Um, but I'll get on the treadmill and set the timer and realize I can always go for one more minute. Like I did, I did one of those like sort of bougie studio classes where the coach yells at you and music's loud and lights are low. Um, and they're always just like, okay, one minute, push one minute, 30 seconds, go. And that taught me that no matter how much I hate it, I can always do something for one more minute. And then you reach the end of that minute and you're just like, well, I, I can probably do another 30 seconds. And I didn't realize it. And so like running probably helps my overall fitness, but I think what running actually did was change my mental game of realizing I can hang on for one more minute. And for climbing that translates into, I can hang on for three more moves or I can try to get to that next hold. Um, and then all of a sudden you're there and I'm like, okay, well let's do one more. And I actually felt that help me um, in my competition climbing was that mental of like one more, like two more, like, it hurts, but I can go further. Um, so running is probably as much for my mental game as it is for working off all the bread and cheese that I can't quit. Um, but then physically, um, climbing is kind of the best training for climbing still. And that's why I'm so lucky to have so many gyms here. Um, I do spend a lot of time cross training, whether it's weightlifting or other things, um, probably more than the average professional climber, just to try to stay balanced. Because if I only rock climbed, my right, as it is, my right arm and shoulder are much more developed than my left. So I do lots of weightlifting to try to kind of keep things balanced. Um, otherwise, spine gets weird and achy and, and stuff. But yeah, sad to say running, running actually is good for you. <laughs> So speaking of indulgences, uh, what is your favorite scotch to drink? So it depends on the season. Um, you have cold weather scotches, which are going to be your smokies, um, like your Lafrags. 
And right now it's summery. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm really into the Glamorangies right now. They're coming out with a lot of great special editions. Um, I did go to a climbing competition in Scotland purely for the Scotch tours afterwards. That was my excuse to get there was the competition. And then we spent a week um, running around. And I think um, Talisker and Oban were my favorite scotches in Scotland. <laughs> Nice. Uh, how did growing up in the state of Maine shape your childhood and affect you as an athlete? Um, I mean, Maine's wild. It's, it's kind of funny living in Colorado now because people are like, oh, yeah, Maine, that's a state, right? Um, <laughs> like, we're just we're far enough away that it's a lot of West Coast folks here. Um, I always tell people it's, it's like it's truly wild. Like Alaska and Maine, I feel like are on par as far as like the woods and the wilderness. And before you know it, you're in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I was really lucky growing up right outside of Acadia. So I got that exposure to climbing in national parks. Um, but then again, like spending my, my summers, almost every summer, all summer up in Millinocket in the wild. Um, I think it just kind of got me that mental state of the quiet and being able to be with that sort of peaceful quiet in nature. Um, and honestly, growing up with the bugs and the humidity, I can never complain about Colorado humidity or bugs because it just pales in comparison. Colorado makes you soft. Um, Maine made me, I was way tougher when I lived in New England than I am now. <laughs> so speaking of Maine, how often are you able to get back here? What are your favorite climbs? Oh, I never enough. <laughs> um, you know, like speaking of COVID, I was planning on spending all of June in Maine at home. Um, I'm not. Um, I try to get back once a year and fortunately with like, flexible work, I can work remote. So, um, hopefully this fall I'll be back. I'd love to do the armadillo again in Katahdin to technical rock climb. Um, I haven't done that since high school. So I'd like to do that again and see if it feels as scary and hard as it did back then. I hope not. I hope it feels easier. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, and then actually I was in Maine in the fall of 2018 and I went to Shag Crag outside of Portland for the first time. Um, that's hard. Maine is producing some hard climbing these days. Um, and that wasn't really a climbing area, at least not a publicly known one when I lived is there. Is that the graffiti area? Sorry? Is that the area with all the graffiti on it? No, um, Shag is pretty out there from Portland, like an hour or so, but it's like pretty steep. It's overhanging granite for climbing. Huh. Like it's, it's wild and it's, it's hard. It's not, it's my anti-style. Um, but then the great thing about Maine too, is you're just like an hour or so generally from places like North Conway. Um, the gunks are so close. So like, I'm definitely looking at moving back to Maine once I'm tired of the front range hustle and bustle because the climbing there is amazing and no one really knows about it. So. <laughs> Do you prefer rock climbing or ice climbing? I prefer, if I were to wake up and decide what to do for fun, it would be rock climbing. Um, ice climbing is my challenge. It's my push. It's the thing that it's, it's hard. It's actually gotten easier. Um, I said the last year I stopped using the prosthetic because um, it didn't fit well and it would sweat off and then freeze. And, and I was always afraid I was going to break my shoulder if I fell while it was stuck in the ice. Um, so I, I ditched... Um, I ditched the prosthetic and started using two regular tools. Um, and I, one of my sponsors, Petzl, um, makes ice tools. And so they helped me kind of finagle the grip a certain way that I could use my stump just directly on the tool. Um, so I've actually started having fun ice climbing again. I'd pretty much quit. Um, for <laughs> I'd pretty much quit ice climbing for about five or six years and then started again with Ernest because um, Chad Jukes and Mike right here invited me to go to Alaska on an ice climbing trip. And I just am not smart enough to say no to these things. <laughs> uh, when you were a kid, who inspired you to follow your dreams? What motivates you to work hard to achieve your goals? Um, I mean, I have to say my mom and dad because they're on this call. <laughs> um, it's interesting, like as far as climbing goes, you know, growing up in Maine was, was pretty insular. Like I didn't, and again, no internet. So I wasn't aware of like, like, I didn't know who Lynn Hill was, who's arguably one of the most famous female climbers of all time. I didn't know who she was until I was, like, halfway through college. Like, no clue. Um, and so, I don't know, I think it was just, I mean, maybe this isn't as much of a compliment as my dad wishes it was, but I think learning to be stubborn um, and picking something and running with it was really what it was. And that just translated to picking a goal and sticking with it and following it through and working hard. But I think the root of all of this is I'm just stubborn. Dumb and stubborn. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being stubborn. <laughs> uh, what are your other goals as a climber that you want to achieve? 
Um, I would love to get back to Chamonix in France. Um, there's some amazing world-class like historical climbs there uh, that are literally falling down. Climate change is hitting the Mont Blanc Valley extremely hard. Um, and I would love to go tag some of those just like absolute classics, the foundation of the history of climbing, um, literally before they fall over. Um, I still haven't been to Yosemite. Uh, it, it's tricky because it's so crowded and popular now because of like all the Don Wall and Free Solo films. It's like, I don't want to go because I like climbing to be quiet and peaceful. But at the same time, it's just, again, it's a rite of passage, just like Chamonix is a rite of passage. I feel like I have to go do the nose. Um, otherwise, getting more into Alpine. So less of the hard as nails next to my car, more of the six hour approaches camping in the Talus field helicoptering into places and being dropped off for a month. Like that's kind of exciting for me. Nice. Uh, is there a nation that has a very robust, enthusiastic climbing community? Uh, as far as paraclimbing, um, we're pretty good. Uh, I would say the U.S. has one of the best paraclimbing programs in the world um, by sheer numbers for sure. So the, we brought 35 people 35 disabled athletes to France last year to compete at the world championships. And the next largest team, I believe was 12. Um, so U.S. rolls hard, <laughs> um, which I'm really proud of. Um, but as far as high performance programs, um, Great Britain has a smaller team, but trounced us in the medal count. Um, so it's one of those things I learn is like, you know, what are the teams doing? Not only to grow the programs like body count wise, but how are they learning how to train people with disabilities? Like, Training for rock climbing is fairly new in the last 15 years or so. Like you just, just climb and climb and now you can hang board and now you can do these cycles to train and how to adapt that to disabled climbers. That's a whole new world still. Like we're, we're writing those books now. Um, and that's a really exciting thing to be a part of, but yeah, I think, I think the U S paraclimbing team has a lot of momentum and energy behind it that I'm really proud of. That's awesome. And a great segue to our next question. Um, you've written a blog. Will you ever write a book? Um, if I were to ever write a book, it'd probably just be a compendium of blog posts because my attention span is so short. I don't think I could actually sit long enough to write a single <laughs> book. <laughs> um, have your parents ever climbed with you? I don't, they'll correct me. I don't think they've ever put on a harness with me. Um, they've come along while I've taken, I have three little brothers and I've taken them outside climbing in Vermont. And every time they come visit in Colorado, we go to the gym. Um, but I don't think my parents have ever actually harnessed up. Um, I'd like to see it happen. I harnessed up <laughs> once. Once, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny because um, two of my brothers are, um, one's Army National Guard and one's Army ROTC. Um, and it's definitely, uh, uh, it makes me kind of a bad person, but I love being able to climb harder than them all the time because they, they, sh they show up all strong and I just put them in their place. Like a big sister should. <laughs> I think that's classic sibling, uh, sibling rivalry right there. Um, what is your favorite championship or tournament that you've participated in? I really love the Scotland one, um, not just because of the scotch, um, but because the local organizers did an amazing job integrating it with the able body competition that was happening at the same time. Um, like we had the same award ceremonies, they gave us prize packs. Um, it was just really well done as far as integration goes. And then similarly, the, um, Austria world championships in 2018, um, was a two week long, huge championships that had paraclimbing integrated every step of the way um, to the point where the finals, we were up on the big stage with like our, our head and our stats on the big screen and like with spotlight as you're climbing. And I've been to so many paraclimbing competitions where the able-bodied climbers get that and then the paraclimbers are like in the basement competing with, with nothing. Um, so, so to see that at Innsbruck really felt like the sport was finally, the paraclimbers were finally getting um, the due that we've been working hard for so long. That's awesome. Um, I know we're getting close to the end of our time, so we're gonna end on a very lighthearted question. What is your favorite type of cupcake? <sighs> There's some really fancy kinds. Um, I'm a big fan of the Oreo crumble cupcake. So it's like a rich dark chocolate with the cream cheese uh, Oreo crumble on top, because I also love Oreos. Um, and I just, I go for calorie. I go for the calorie binge, like the most calories you can pack into a cupcake. That's my jam. <laughs> 
But it, it's real because you might not eat. Like if you're going climbing for a day, especially in the Alpine, like you only have bars, like you don't travel with a lot of food. So at the car on your drive, you're just pounding bagels and donuts and cupcakes. And maybe that's why I really want to be an Alpine climber. You can just eat whatever you want because burn it all off. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Hey, Mo, thanks so much. Um, it was great having this very public conversation with you. <laughs> well, I, I, hopefully I'll see you before, but if not, see you in Alaska next year. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And uh, keep everybody posted on uh, your next exploits in the wilderness because it's fun to watch. Will do. <laughs> thanks again, Mo. Thank you.